John's, it's wonderful to see you here today um, as we start to worship our God. Um, Psalm 56, 13 says, For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So let's sing about how our God has saved our soul. Please stand. my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, and you save my soul. I was lost when you came for me, held in chains. 
Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. If I haven't met you yet, I'm looking forward to meeting you at the door on the way out. My name is Matt Stedman, and I'm the senior minister here. That is my privilege. Uh, I hope you're well. I wanted to start our service this morning by praying a prayer for the events that happened in Bondi Junction just yesterday afternoon. This is a prayer written by our Archbishop Kanishka, and I wanted to start our time off by praying for that very tragic event which has impacted or far-reaching impacts across our city. So let me pray as we start. Sovereign Lord, loving Heavenly Father, we grieve the loss of life through acts of violence, not just in Bondi Junction, but our city this week. Lord, we ask that you would comfort all those who grieve who've been impacted by these events. And we give thanks for the members of the public, the police, ambulance, medicine personnel, who were the first responders to that event. And so, Lord, we pray for the recovery of those who have been injured and those who continue to be distressed by those traumatic circumstances. Uh, Father, we are often confused and distressed by the violence and senseless acts in our city. And so, Lord, this morning we cast our anxieties onto you, knowing that you do care for us. And we pray that you would turn our hearts this morning to your son, that we might find rest in him and hasten the day, Lord, when peace and justice reign. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, a somber way to start our service, but a fitting one, I think. We are glad you're with us today. I'm thrilled that you're with us today, actually. And I hope you really are encouraged and inspired and changed by what we hear this morning as we gather. Uh, Leah will be preaching this morning, her first time preaching in this place. Uh, so Leah, thank you for that, and we look forward to, to having you speak for us this morning. As some of you might remember this, 1961, uh, Ru Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, first man in space, uh, utterly fa uh, fa uh, mentioned or uttered these famous words, something like this, supposedly, I looked and looked and didn't see God. Or this, I, I didn't see any God up here. One of those, supposedly he, he's famous for, for saying those words, by which he meant that there is no God, which you might expect from someone living in, in the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, if I can't see him, if I can't hear him, if I can't find him, then he mustn't exist. I guess the best analogy for, for that is walking into a newly built home in Leppington and searching high and low and coming to the conclusion that there is no builder and there is no architect. Because there's no builder to be found in the building. They've long gone and there's no architect. They're living or they're working in Macquarie Street somewhere in the city. They're not actually in the house. Here's the thing, the architect isn't there, the builder isn't there. No matter how hard you look in that house, in every cupboard, nook and cranny, you will not find that builder. And it's the same with God. You can search God for God everywhere. You can even go to another place in the, in the Milky Way or outer space, and you will not find him because God is not in his creation. He remains very separate from his creation. That's a key piece of Christian doctrine or theology. And that, friends, is why Christians make a massive deal about what we call the incarnation when God takes on flesh and becomes a human being. That is not us looking for God. That is God coming to look and find us. And he came to show us his grace, what he's like. He came to redeem the world by dying on the cross and returning to life, which means we can only know God because he has come and found us. He has come and shown us his kindness. And we want to be a community that is shaped by God's grace. In fact, it's one of our mission priorities, to be a community shaped 
by God's grace. We read this in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word, which is John's word for Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And so we gather again this morning to be reminded that Jesus did come and look for us and he is not far from any one of us. Let me pray for us as we commence. Lord, we thank you for gathering here this beautiful day. Father, we pray that we would hear you speak to us through your word. Father, as we gather, we pray that we would worship you and that you would be changing and morphing our hearts to be the heart that beats for you. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand and we sing, grace awaiting me. Let's stand and sing together this morning.
please take a seat. Well, it's great to be with you here this morning. My name is Matt. I'm the children's minister here. Uh, and who here has ever played the game, do this, do that? Have you ever played the game, do this, do that? Okay, the, the rules are very simple. If you do this, if I, sorry, if I say do this, you've got to do it. If I say do that, you don't do it. Okay? So, for example, if I say do this, okay, everyone should have their hands on their heads. Yeah? Do this. Okay, do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do that. Now, if you touch your head, ooh, it's not what you're meant to do. Okay, so we'll play a few quick rounds. Are you ready? Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do that. No. Oh. Okay, do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do that. Oh. Okay, do that. Oh, do that. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. Oh, okay, we've got some survivors. Okay, today we're actually going to be learning a bit more about Joseph. And Joseph has become a slave. And what it means to be a slave is that you have to do this. You have to do whatever your master tells you to do. So his master might say, do the dishes. He does the dishes. Clean the temple. He cleans the temple. Do my hair. He does his hair. He's got to do whatever his master tells him to do. And we're going to find out what happens with Joseph today. So for our holiday program for kids, kids from preschool to year five, we're going to be watching Joseph, Prince of Dreams. Uh, sorry, Joseph, King of Dreams. The uh, other one is Prince of Egypt. Uh, and we're going to be watching that down in the hall. So it's rated G, and we'll be skipping over a little scary part at the start. Uh, and we also have a holiday crèche for those who would like to make use of that. We've got some parents volunteering for that this week. So if you are in crèche to year five, we're going to head out now and head down to our programs. Uh, this is a chance for everyone else to uh, turn to the person next to you and welcome one another. All right, peace reigns, the children have gone. Uh, they've got an exciting morning ahead of them, as do we. Friends, let me bring a couple of notices to your attention. Firstly, as always, if you'd like to connect with us, and that is what we're about here at church, connecting with one another and helping one another connect with God, our connect cards are in the pews in front of you. If you'd like to let us know you've been here, something on your heart you'd like us to pray about, uh, fill that in, drop it in the collection plate as it passes you by during the final song. Uh, this morning. Uh, we also have a men's 4x4 four four event coming up. I went last year. I had a brilliant time. I can't wait to go back uh, this year as well. 3rd to the 5th of May. Uh, use that QR code and there's flyers in our Connect booth at the back on your right on the way in. So grab one of those. You don't need a 4x4. Four four. I don't have one. I just jump in someone else's and uh, they pay for the fuel, so it all works out well. Uh, so do come along to that. And bonus, it's fully catered as well, so you don't have to worry about food. You just need some sort of shelter. That would be helpful. Uh, finally, before we go to a video, I haven't forgot about the video. Uh, the tech team's worried that I have. I haven't. Uh, we are going uh, this term two community group. We are reading through this book. It's such a good book. I read it during COVID or just after, or maybe just before. How to Talk About Jesus, subtitle, Without Being That Guy. Uh, I have been that guy, I'm sure, before, and the book's going to teach me how not to be, but how to grow in our ability to share the gospel. I, I'm about to preach a series on this uh, called Head, Heart and Hands, and I'm convinced all of us, most of us, have the desire to share Christ with people. We don't know what to do next. This book is going to actually help, and so is the sermon series as well. So look forward to that. Uh, available for sale up the back, just, before, just behind Howard there. $21 cash or card. You won't regret buying that. And if you do, come and speak to me about it. We can have a chat. 
Uh, we support the Jameers. Uh, the Jameers are in Arnhem Land. We, we know this. We love the Jameers. We have an update from them. And we're going to go to that now. Let's do that. One more click. Hello, Hello Camden St. John's, John's Church. Church. I wanted to say thank you so much for your continual support, love and care, and especially prayers for us. We continue to press on with the work that God is um, putting, us, putting in front of us here. Um, just the other week, there was this lovely grandma of ours. Um, she was very ill, and she went to Darwin, and um, things didn't go very well for her was flown back to community um, to have the last few days with her family on land, on country. And it was such an opportunity that God provided for us that we could gather around um, with our brothers and sisters in Christ and read God's word, pray, sing uh, for this lady and for her family. And uh, I felt such a hope she did pass away and seeing her face there was such a peace on her face that I was comforted knowing that she is with our Lord that was a wonderful opportunity that God had provided for us to be a part of there is also the other aspects of uh, work that we continue to do on, uh, like running the Bible study, women's Bible study group, uh, meeting up men and women. There's been a number of men and women who continue to come, uh, you know, seeking our prayer support and any kind of support that we want. We try to extend our support and encourage them. Um, there has been an, uh, many opportunities where I have been asked to share God's word. Just recently, just on the weekend gone, um, a premature baby who unfortunately had passed away was brought to the community for burial. And um, the family had approached us uh, seeking uh, my uh, service to share the gospel, the gospel. And it was an opportunity, a God-given opportunity to share God's word. Um, even on the burial day, they asked me to uh, share God's word. So, um, yeah, God has been gracious to us in that way where there are um, opportunities for us to continue sharing uh, and encouraging the men, women, and children here in the community through God's word. Nara Yomuyaku Wurpo, which means I own flower. Saya is in year eight and she's doing really well. She loves going to school. And Tiasen is now in year one and she's going to school and they're doing really well. They both um, do English and maths at home. Saya so does it through Catherine's school there. And then about just after English and Mass, they head off to school and um, to Gapawiak school. And they're um, doing well, learning language and culture and making friends. It's challenging at times, um, living in another culture, but they're doing very well. And we just really thank you for St. John and your constant prayer and support. Thank you, Camden St. John's Church. A very different lifestyle and cultural area they're seeking to minister in. Uh, for cultural reasons, we can't show either the land they're working in or the people they're working with, but uh, we pray for them nonetheless, and uh, I'm going to do that right now. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Emily and Heather and their girls working in Arnhem Land. Father, a hugely challenging area to work, but seeking to bring words of truth and hope and comfort to the people they live amongst. Father, bless them, we pray. Thank you for our partnership with them. Help us to be faithful in prayer. Help us to be generous as a church financially so they can continue to continue the work in that part of the world. And Lord, we pray that that family would be a conduit of your grace 
and of your love and forgiveness to the people around them. Father, keep them in good health. Lord, help them to keep, be faithful to your word. Lord, be with their girls as they, uh, as they learn and as they go to school as well. And Father, we pray for Emily and Heather's marriage as well. Lord, watch over that, we pray and protect it. And Lord, we pray all of those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Emily is going to read the Bible for us, Genesis chapter 39, if you want to open that now. All right, so today's reading comes from Genesis 39, uh, and it will start at verse 19. You can find it on page 58 if you're not there yet. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Jesus was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected, so he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of his prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favourable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Emily, for reading the passage for us. Um, If I haven't met you yet, my name is Leah and I'm one of the assistant ministers here at St. John's. Uh, Please keep Genesis chapter 39 open in front of you and uh, let me pray. Father of all, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. As we open Genesis now, help us to hear. 
Help us to let your word into our hearts and minds, to know you better and be better able to love you and live for you each day. Allow what we hear to help frame our lives and let us fully dwell on what you are saying. Amen. Framework is important. It's important as we think about uh, how we approach things, how we structure, how we build. I've been a bit slow jumping on the bandwagon, but I'm watching the Alone series on SBS at the moment. And it's been interesting to see how participants build the framework for their shelters, one of the very first thing a person does. Some were built quickly and for short-term use. Others were given, given deep consideration and have withstood the harsh rains and winds that have battered them on many occasions. So today I want us to think about framework, the framework through which we view life, the framework that we build our lives around and how that framework weathers the storms of life, the ups and downs, the hard circumstances that we will all inevitably face. There are two things that we see in Joseph's story that frame how he tackles life's circumstances, that God is with him and that God is working his purposes. So let's unpack that. We're in the story of the life of Joseph in Genesis, moving through a four week sermon series. And something that we've seen so far and will continue to see is that Joseph's life is full of ups and downs, easy and hard times, good and bad circumstances, rises and falls. And it begs the question, well, where is God in this roller coaster of life? Where is he when we hit rock bottom, when we're thrown a curveball, when the rug is pulled out from underneath us? Where is God? God is with us. The continuing refrain throughout these chapters of Genesis is that God is with Joseph. And that's also what is promised for us, God's people as well. When I was about 10 years old, my dad took my sister and I up to Lake Keep It, which is kind of up near Tamworth, and we went paragliding. I don't know if you know anything about paragliding, but what it involves is a parachute uh, attached to you running down a hill and off a cliff. Uh, yeah, the parachute inflates, and then you spend time slowly gliding down to the ground, enjoying the scenery around you. Now, I've got to say that running down a hill to jump off a cliff is pretty petrifying, right? parachute or not. And as a 10 year old, well, I don't know what to do if something goes wrong or how to control things. And I clearly remember thinking, well, what if I'm running down this hill and I trip and uh, I fall off the cliff? What happens then, right? Well, thankfully, I was not doing this alone. I had a tandem instructor with me and he knew what he was doing. He was an expert. He was trustworthy. He knew what to do if something went wrong and he would be with me. And I could run off that cliff, and I did in full confidence, knowing that even though I was out of my depth and I was petrified, that he was with me and he was in control. Well, Joseph's journey so far has been anything but cruisy. There's been some good times, yes, but there's also been some shockers. At the start of Joseph's story in Genesis 37, we see that Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife, is also Jacob's favorite son. He's the 11th son born to Jacob. And in Genesis 37 verse three, it tells us explicitly that Joseph is loved more than any of his, other, any of his brothers. Matt opened up to us last week about the dysfunction of this family. Joseph rises in the eyes of his father and it's a, uh, and in the status by the giving of that ornate robe, if you remember, but his brothers in anger and jealousy and hatred take an opportunity to get rid of Joseph, falsely telling their father that he is dead, selling him to traders, so that eventually Joseph ends up in Egypt as a slave. That's a shocking turn in life. Where is God in this? In chapter 37, God is notably absent, or is he? Just because God isn't performing miracles or putting up neon signs does not mean that he is not present, that he is not working. Whether it's obvious or not, God is always with his people and God is always working. And as Christians, we are assured of this through the presence of the Holy Spirit, promised to all believers by Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And we're also shown it that God is always with his people and he's always working through the life of Joseph. And now as we get to chapter 39, we see that Joseph is in Egypt. He's a slave and he's been bought by Potiphar, an Egyptian official, the captain of the guard. What this title really means is he's like the commander in chief. He's someone very important, very close to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. And right at the beginning of chapter 39 in verse two, we read, 
The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Where is God in this roller coaster of Joseph's life? He is with Joseph. And just in case we didn't get it the first time, it's repeated numerous times throughout chapters 39 to 41. Chapter 39, verse 21 and verse 23. Chapter 40, verse 8. And chapter 41, verse 28, where God gives Joseph the interpretation of dreams. God is with Joseph throughout the troubles with his family in chapter 37 and now through his time in Egypt because life continues to be full of challenging circumstances for Joseph, which we will unpack. Yet through all these circumstances, the narrative makes it clear. God is with Joseph. No miraculous signs, no neon lights, just consistently pre present and working through Joseph to bless and save others. We all know what it is to face hardships in this world. Some have faced harder times than others, some more heartbreak than others, but it's touched all of our lives. Horatio Spafford knew something about life's hard circumstances. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. And around the same time, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship over to England, planning to join them after he finished off some business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and it sank. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, saved alone, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do when I face the roller coaster ride that is life, the ups and downs, the depths of brokenness? Well, I believe it has to do with the, with the, the framework through which we view our circumstances. So let's take a closer look at Joseph in chapters 39 to 41 to help us answer this question. Joseph becomes a slave in Potiphar's household. Potiphar is one of Pharaoh's officials, as we've seen, the captain of the guard. And Joseph prospered there. Chapter 39, beginning at verse two. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he trusted everything to his care. Joseph was obviously a man who conducted himself with integrity in the eyes of those around him. He flees from sin when Potiphar's wife demands that he sleep with her, knowing that it is firstly against God and also wronging his master. And when he's falsely accused of rape by Potiphar's wife, it's worth noting that Joseph isn't immediately condemned to execution. If a slave, which is what Joseph was, commits a crime like rape against his master's wife, the punishment for that would be death, it would be execution. Places of confinement where you serve a sentence, like the jails we have today, were not a practice in that society. Yet Potiphar, the captain of the guard, puts Joseph in prison, an extension of God's grace in these circumstances to bring about his purpose of salvation later. Chapter 39, verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Perhaps Potiphar suspected that there was some foul play on his wife's behalf, that he knew Joseph's character was at odds with the story that he was hearing. Whatever the case, Joseph is being held in confinement until a decision about him can be made. Now the place where Joseph is imprisoned is actually Potiphar's house. Uh, the chief cupbearer, when he's speaking to Pharaoh in chapter 41 says, Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. And not only that, but when the cupbearer and the baker offend Pharaoh and are imprisoned at the house of the captain of the guard, that's Potiphar's house, it is Potiphar who puts Joseph in charge of them. In chapter 40, verse four, the captain of the guard assigned them, that's the cupbearer and baker, to Joseph, and he attended them. What we see is God working, putting the people in the places together so that his purposes and plans of salvation can come about. So Joseph is there when the cupbearer and the baker have their dreams, and God gives Joseph the ability to interpret them. 
The cupbearer is restored to, Joseph's, to Pharaoh's service, as Joseph said would happen, and when Pharaoh has a dream and looks for someone to interpret it, the cupbearer is in the right place at the right time and remembers Joseph and tells Pharaoh about him. Joseph is able to interpret Pharaoh's dream about the future of Egypt and is placed as the wise and discerning man above all others, second only to Pharaoh himself and in charge of securing the future of Egypt through this famine that is to come. And not only Egypt, but chapter 41 verse 57 says that when the famine had spread, all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. Joseph was never alone. God was always with him and God was working, working his purpose of keeping his covenantal promise to grow his people into a great nation. Through Joseph, his family is saved from starvation. They're able to come and flourish in the land of Egypt. And Joseph can say to his brothers at the end of Genesis in chapter 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, Joseph isn't the direct line through which God's ultimate fulfillment of these promises happens, the coming of Jesus Christ, through whom the whole world is blessed. That falls to Judah, Joseph's brother. But looking back with hindsight at the events in Joseph's life, he can see and we can see that God is working for his purpose of keeping that covenant with Abraham, saving his family, and ultimately setting up God's people Israel for the biggest salvation moment in the Old Testament, Moses and the Exodus. Exodus from Egypt, and down the line from that, of course, Jesus and the salvation of the whole world. How did Joseph face the hardships that kept coming his way? Joseph faced them with a resilience that was secure in him because of the framework through which he viewed life. He knew that God was always working his purpose to save. We don't hear much about how Joseph felt as he faced jealousy, betrayal, slavery, accusations, confinement, being forgotten. Because of that, I think it's easy to picture Joseph as this stoic, hardened man who just seems to have the hurtfulness of his circumstances roll right off him. But that would be unfair to judge Joseph that way. Don't forget, Joseph was only 17 years old when he was betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave. He had his freedom ripped from him and given over to the whim of whomever bought him. He had no control over his future. Or when he did everything right, respecting God and his master Potiphar, saying no to the demands of Potiphar's wife to sleep with him, only then to be falsely accused. The injustice, the wanting to shout and plead his innocence, the fear of certain death because of this accusation. I think Joseph knew despair. I think Joseph knew hopelessness. I think Joseph knew unfairness and injustice. I believe he knew them and he felt them acutely. But he didn't stay in the brokenness of his circumstances. He didn't look inside himself for purpose or answers. He didn't say, why me? Instead, he looked outside himself to the framework that held up his life, that God is with him and that God is working and so he could faithfully move through those circumstances, still feeling their pain, but not held captive to them. What framework holds up your life that you work out your decision, your choices, your priorities, your purpose through? I hear most of you think God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and I would hope to hear that from those sitting here in church. But let's spend some time reflecting. Because how we face hardships is a good indicator of our life framework. Let me give you another example of a framework. Did you know that the pursuit of happiness is written into the US Declaration as a human right? Let me read it to you. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whether it's obvious or not, we can let the pursuit of happiness influence our choices and our attitudes towards our circumstances. And in this modern era, there is an assumed right we have to be happy, a mindset of entitlement to happiness. That can be, then become the framework through which we face life. 
My kids enjoyed the Easter weekend and I'm sure like most kids, something that made them really happy over that time was the amount of chocolate that they got to eat and is now in our cupboard. They would have been happy to eat through all the chocolate in one sitting, I think. But just because that would make them happy doesn't mean it was the right thing. Of course it wouldn't be. Happiness is subjective. It's fluid. It's momentary. Not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with being happy, but when the pursuit of happiness becomes our framework for life, as it may be for some, when the choices that we make in our circumstances come down to what we think will make us happy, then when we inevitably come to the hard times, the messy moments and the deep darkness, we will not cope. We will look inwards to ourselves and we'll cry out, why God, why me? Why did I deserve this? Because the hardship has come into conflict with our purpose in life, the pursuit of happiness. And so we struggle to move forward. We see the hardships as punishment. We dwell in our despair. We're broken by these hard circumstances. The pursuit of happiness as a framework to life will always fail because it is dependent on us. It has us looking inward to what we think will make us happy. That's what phrases like keeping up with the Joneses are banking on, that you believe you'll be happy if you just manage to get into the housing market or if you have the latest iPhone or you go to the right school or you just have what you see other people having. You pursue those things believing that they'll make you happy where then do you find hope when hardship comes your way? If those things that you pursued to make you happy as your purpose in life are for some reason taken away, how do you pick yourself up and keep going? But there is a better framework through which to tackle life circumstances. One that does not have us looking inward to ourselves, but rather outward. A secure and everlasting framework provided for us by God, that he is always with us, and working out his purpose to save. Even in his hardest moment, Jesus was able to remember the truth that he was not alone, that God was with him and God was working. His world was in chaos. Judas, his friend, had betrayed him to the chief priests. Peter, his best friend, would desert him in his darkest hour. And he knew that he was facing the physical pain and degradation of death by crucifixion. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 26, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And Jesus goes to pray. And instead of asking for happy circumstances, instead of demanding to know why all this hurt is happening to him, Jesus says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He stepped forward in those circumstances, trusting that God was with him and God was working. He had that framework that allowed him to keep moving forward through the hardness of his circumstances. That cup was a heavy cup to bear. It was filled with the sin and the guilt and the shame of this world. But Jesus also knew that him bearing that cup to the cross was part of God's purpose of salvation for all humanity. And so he said, not my will, but yours be done, God. Jesus didn't make decisions based on the pursuit of his happiness, but rather with his eyes fixed on God's purpose, and he resiliently went to the cross. The writer of Hebrews really captures this in these words, which will come up on the screen as well. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The framework, the joy set before him meant that he endured the cross, overcame it and sits in victory at the right hand of God. And the author says, consider him who endured. Consider Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that when you face the hardships that will come, you have the framework in your life to faithfully move through them so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Know God is with you and that he is working his purpose to save. Know that sin has been defeated by Jesus' death on the cross. 
that we are saved from the darkness of hopelessness and guaranteed a place of eternal life because Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider all the hardships that Jesus went through and yet he endured and overcame. We can do the same thing in his strength too, fixing our eyes on him. Let me finish Horatio Spatford's story after hearing the news of the deaths of his daughters. Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spatford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the place where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind. He wrote them down and they've since become a well-beloved hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. That famous hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was penned out of a heartbreaking circumstance for Spatford's li in Spatford's life. How could he do that? How could he face that hard time? He remembered that he was never alone, that God was always with him and God was working. And how wonderfully God did work through that beautiful hymn that Horatio wrote and how it has blessed many over the years. The framework through which Spatford view all of life circumstances didn't have him looking in and asking why, why me, but rather it had him looking out to the secure and everlasting framework of a God who is with his people and always working his purpose of salvation, even when circumstances in our life is hard. So Horatio could say, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let me pray. Gracious and good God, thank you for the sure promise you have made to always be with us, your people, and working your purpose of salvation. Thank you that you demonstrated this fully in sending Jesus. Help us to know this truth deeply, to use it to frame the circumstances that come our way in life, just as Joseph did. For any here today struggling through hardship, feeling weary, please strengthen them, surround them with your love, and help them to fix their eyes on Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming freely to pray. Let us now pray. O mighty, wondrous God, the author of life, the chief cornerstone, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, Emmanuel, God with us, the way, the truth, and the life, the living word, and the great I am. Help your people put their lives, hope, and trust in you, Lord God, and you alone. We come to you today humbled by your holiness, your magnificence, your grace, your love, yes, your pure agape, agape love for each soul ever created and ever to be created. This was displayed at Calvary's cross. Help us never to forget it and never to take it for granted. Your love goes on. The Father gave the Son and the Son gave the Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling and strengthening all the Anglicare workers, counsellors and volunteers with your love, strength, hope and Holy Spirit's wisdom and enabling gifts. Please help each one of us, Lord, to realise daily our vocation of being royal ambassadors for Christ in the master's service. Help us to be a welcoming, friendly people full of God's love and not judgment. So they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Let them know we are Christians by our love. For all those mighty God who are sick and ailing, those struggling with various disorders, addictions, bad habits and many hang-ups, and for those suffering with any health issues, may the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings and touch and anoint the sick and the needy, so miracles will happen and health and life be restored and renewed to the glory of God. And please lead many to get the correct medical help that they may need. Please help 
grant all healthcare workers great strength, wisdom, compassion and love in every, in every area from pregnancy, neonatal, infant and childcare, mental health to men's and women's health, disability, aged care and palliative care. And for all those in the workplace, Lord, facing moral and relational issues, we pray you bless them and grant them much boldness and wisdom to cling to kingdom ethics of honesty, compassion, grace and integrity. And bless your people, Lord, so that their businesses will grow and flourish and finances will no longer be blocked, but will pour forth in abundance. We thank you, Lord God, for the power of your holy word, for the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Please, mighty God, wherever your holy word is taught and shared, in churches, schools, preschools, nursing homes, hospitals, university, in the acting and the sports arena, through chaplains, with media, everywhere, everywhere, Lord God, please anoint your word to bear great fruit, fruit that will last, eternal fruit. Your word, O oh Lord, brings healing and forgiveness, humility, and the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Help us, O oh Lord, to hide your word in our hearts so we might not sin against you. Please, God, bring more opportunities to share your word and raise up workers for the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are very few. Thank you for your wonderful missionaries that we heard from today, Lord. Emily and Heather Jamir, pioneers in Arnhem Land, Northern Territory. We pray you grant them much wisdom and protection of the blood of the Lamb always. Bless their work and the church that they're at. And all, con all concerned there, Lord God, let them seek you and read and obey your word. Lord, that the elders would take up leadership of the church and please help the women to grow in love and knowledge of the Lord and his word and share this good news with their families. We ask you, Lord, for the men to rise up and to meet and pray one with another. Great and wondrous God, you know the great needs that are here today. The grief, pain and suffering of those who feel alone, betrayed, abused, and the pain of those that have lost loved ones and seen their children go astray. The agony of dysfunctional relationships, including the estranged prodigals that have just kept silent over many, many years. Oh Jesus, we cry out today for your healing anointing to be poured out so families can be restored and renewed and revitalized for the glory of God. Just like in the brilliant sermon that Leah just gave us, Lord, of Joseph, Lord God, has he said to his brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as to save many lives. Here, O oh Lord, is grace and forgiveness the key. Wondrous, bounteous, loving God, you alone make all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. You alone, Lord, take care and take, Lord God, our mess and turn it into a message. You take our tests, Lord God, and turn them into a testimony. And you take our scars, Lord God, and turn them into stars. We thank you with all our hearts and give praise to your holy name, the name of above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We pray all things in this mighty name of Jesus and everyone says, Amen. Thanks, Gabrielle. Before we head down for morning tea and conclude our service, can I invite you to stand as we say the words of the Apostles' Creed, the ancient summary of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to worship God one more time in song. Our final song, When I Survey, we'll take a collection during this song. 
and that collection will be used for the expansion of God's kingdom. Please, Lord, both here in Camden, MacArthur, and to the ends of the earth as well. Let's sing. the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And we hope you to see you down having some morning tea together. Thanks guys. Well I didn't know whether they were going to... Sometimes they do. <laughs> Just play.